Welcome to Might I Add, the first student-run sports talk show spinoff at UCF. I'm Kyle Partain, and I'll be talking all things UCF sports each week in a discussion with one of our HTF analysts. This week, I'm joined by HTF rookie Brendan Schaefer. Brendan, how you doing, man? Feels like a sad day, but I'm getting there. Yeah, there's a lot to talk about, a lot going on this weekend with UCF sports. And we'll start it with football. It was a tough weekend for the Knights, traveling up to Pittsburgh, where a close game ultimately ended up in a heartbreaking 35-34 loss for the Knights. Pitt started the game on a 21-0 run, but the Knights came back in the third quarter to take a lead. Pitt, however, scored with a touchdown with under a minute to go to steal the win from the Knights. Brendan, can you talk about what went wrong for UCF in this game? It was a lot of things. Um, you could point to the play calling, you could look at some freshman mistakes by Gabriel, but I think, personally, it's the overconfidence. I think UCF was getting a little too confident and comfortable in their laurels. They underestimated Pitt, and in the end, it came back to bite them. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point. I want to I wanna start with that. Throughout this run, since the Frost, Frost second season, right, we went undefeated that season, then it was another successful year last year, and now this year, there hasn't been a whole lot of praise for UCF. And the mantra's been, go 1-0, they tune out all the outside noise. It's real easy to tune out criticism, but now the praise picks up this week. It's a lot harder to tune out praise. Do you think that, like you said, Herb Street earlier, you, saw, you talked about Herb Street. Do you think that has any real impact on how the team just performed, just lack of concentration? Oh, absolutely. It's easy to say that you're not paying attention to that kind of thing, but if I'm getting praised by a teacher, if I'm getting praised by my old coaches, I'm going to listen to it whether or not I say I am or not. So. These kids, they're trying to fall into the way, you know, the hype away, but they're going to be listening. They know people like ESPN, like Herb Street, ABC, they're saying all these praises. It's going to get in their ear sooner or later, and now it was sooner. So a couple, a couple things to note here. The rushing game was virtually non-existent for UCF. We had a total of 85 rushing yards in the game. Adrian Killens was the leader with 46. He scored that one touchdown, which was nice, but... UCF's offensive line has been really priding themselves this season on opening up lanes, but that was just non-existent today. What kind of went wrong there? They just seem really quiet. Pitt, from the get-go, from the front seven to the back, they just looked like they wanted it more, and it looked like it in the front seven. They were just pushing more. They were getting in their lanes more. And they just they wanted it more. Simple as that. Yeah, and the, uh, another thing to talk about is the discipline. That was a real, real issue. In the, I, I believe it was late in the third. There was a point in the game, there was a drive for Pittsburgh where UCF committed three straight personal fouls, giving up 45 yards for Pittsburgh. It resulted in a score, um, and that just can't happen, especially late in the game. The Knights are up six, Pitt's driving. It's fourth and five at about the 25-yard line, and the Knights jump offsides. First down, Pitt inevitably scores on that drive. There was a chance to take Pitt out of the game, finish it there, and as the kind of story went the, uh, throughout the game, penalty killed us. So how do you, you know, fix those mistakes? How do you make you know, the team play cleaner? That's just the kind of backbreaking thing that you're just going to have to watch it over and over and over again. And you're going to have to remind yourself, not one play really costs the game, but if you could point to one, that's the play that costs them the game. And if you're Hypel, if you're the coaches, the positional coaches, you point that one out, make them watch it as many times as you can, never let it happen again. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the mistakes. There were a bunch of mistakes in this game. And some of it's on the players. Some of it could potentially be thrown, you know, directed toward the coaching staff. And there's one play in particular that really stands out as kind of a sore thumb for, the, uh, for UCF. And that was late in the game, in the fourth quarter. UCF is up by three. And it's fourth and two inside, I believe, the 15-yard line. And instead of kicking the field goal, UCF goes for it. They don't get it. Pitt clearly could not kick field goals throughout the game. So you force Pitt to go up for go for a touchdown at that point in the game, and UCF would end up scoring another field goal. So if you get those three points from that uh, from that, you end up winning the game. So is that on Hypel or is that just part of the system that we run? I hate to say it, but I think that's absolutely on Hypel. That from such an offensive-minded coach, that seems like such a rookie mistake. Fourth and two, you know, you take the points with that much time left in the match. You take the points, and even if you're going to go for it on fourth and two. Don't do something as simple as running right into the middle of a front seven that you haven't been able to penetrate all game. It's just, it's poor, poor play calling on his part, just completely. Yeah, and it, again, there were a bunch of mistakes, but I mean, you look at a grand scheme of things, it's one loss. That was the first regular season loss in several years for UCF. And they still got a chance to make a statement this weekend with a big bounce back win against UConn. But before we get to that UConn game, 
What are your thoughts on the New Year's Six chances for the Knights? It's going to be rough because, as we know, with the G5, it's the highest ranking. And right now, it's going to be between them and Boise State. Boise State, looking at their schedule, I really don't know if they drop another one. UCF could very well run the table, win every game by 40 points, and it might not be enough. I think they still will, but it's going to be an upward climb for the rest of the season. Yeah, it's never good to uh, not have your own destiny in your hands. But anyways, you know, it wasn't the result the team would have liked against Pittsburgh. But, you know, they get a chance to bounce back this weekend as conference play starts. UCF is going to host UConn on Saturday in the bounce house. So, Brendan, what do you expect to see from the Knights this week when they take on good old UConn? I would just like to apologize right now to all the UConn fans, coaches, players, alumni. I'm sorry for what's going to happen this weekend because UCF is not going to take it lightly. The fans are going to be louder than ever. They're going to be playing angry. It's going to be... I think it's going to be a slaughter. That's the only word I can use. Oh, so you're saying you're saying blowout. You, you have any uh, any thoughts on whether to be ground attack, you know, passing attack, or both? I think from the get-go, Dylan Gabriel and that offense should just be running four verts. Just hit them deep, hit them quick, get them out of the game early, and then just keep putting your foot just on that throat. No mercy. So yeah, we think the offense will score. They've scored 30 points in however many straight games it is now. What about the defense? UConn, UConn has not thrown for a touchdown yet this season in three games. They're one and two coming off back-to-back -back losses. But they haven't thrown for a passing touchdown. Is the secondary going to feast in this game? Well, considering their losses in the Indiana and Illinois, not exactly powerhouses, and they weren't even able to penetrate that defense, what do you think they're going to do against UCF? Again, the defense is going to be playing even angrier because with that penalty, they might be thinking they cost them that game. They're going to come out angry. They are going to feast. So we're thinking it's going to be a feast. Well, you know, like the football team, it happened to be a tough weekend for UCF Volleyball as well. The Knights hosted the Sunshine State Classic and were expected to have a clear advantage over the competition. However, UCF lost its opening two matches against FGCU and Miami before taking their win over FAU in the third game. Brendan, what went wrong for the Knights in those games? It just seemed to be a lack of concentration. Uh, they didn't really get... You know, it seemed a lot like ISO ball, and you see that in basketball, but volleyball, it really has to be a team sport. You've got to be working with your front line. You have to be working with your back. And they just seem to, you know, not be aggressive enough and just out of sorts for those first two. That's a good point to make. A couple stats here. McKenna Melville, in the losses to FGCU and Miami, she had 35% of all kills for the Knights. Those resulted in two losses. Now, when they played FAU, she didn't lead the Knights in kills. She only had five kills. She didn't lead the team. No Knight had more than 10 kills. And it was a sweep against FAU, three sets to none. Is there some kind of correlation there? Do they need to share the ball as much as possible or get it in the hands of their star player as much as possible? You know, the science says correlation does not always equal causation, but this is not an always. Correlation absolutely does. This is a team sport. You have to work with your team, star or no. You work better as a cohesive unit, and you saw it in the stats. So another thing is they got to play clean volleyball. They didn't play that way in their losses. They committed 41 total errors in their two losses. And that's a number that can't happen. So what does Coach Todd Dagen need to uh, coach up on this week to prevent those kind of errors from happening? It's just, it's, you know, it's a mental thing. It's focus. You got to just run. If it's simplifying your plan, just don't overcomplicate things. You know, just focus on what you can do. Stop trying to be the hero or the ISO, just work off each other. And if you have to run it over and over and over and over again, you do it until that concentration is there, 110%. All right, so let's, let's look forward to this UConn game on Friday. What are the keys to that game? What does UCF need to do? Well, we've already said it. They have to spread the ball. They have to work off each other. They cannot let it, one person have 35% of the kills. It's just obviously not going to lead to a win. So if they spread it around, they win easy. So it was a rough start, but we'll get to some more positive things as we take things across the country to California, where the women's soccer team played against Long Beach State and UC Irvine. The result? Two games, two dubs for the Knights as they come home to prepare for conference play. Those wins make it five in a row now for UCF. Brendan, what's this team done to be on such a roll right now? Goals, goals, goals. Zandi Soray and Ellie Moreno and, of course, Kristen Scott. They are just scoring like mad women. I want to say mad men, but, you know, got to get it right. So let's talk a little bit about the emergence of Zandi Soray. 
what has she done recently to really just allow her to be that second offensive weapon aside, like next to Kristen Scott? I think it's just that Mamba mentality. She's seen what Kristen's doing. She wants to provide that one-two punch. All the great soccer teams, men's or women's, you always see it's the one-two punch. So they saw Kristen, she's leading the team with five goals. Zandi said, okay, I think I can do that. So she only went and did it in the last three games. Scoring, 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 it's easy. That's a good point. Saray, she picked up her first goal of the season in a win against Arizona State. The very next game, they play Stetson, she scores twice. And then the very next game after that, they play Long Beach State, she scores again. All of a sudden, she's the second leading scorer for UCF. And that's gotta be really, really comforting for Coach Sahadak to see that there is that second offensive weapon. It's comforting for coach, it's comforting for the offense, it's comforting for everybody on that team because if you see multiple people scoring goals, and especially Zandi herself, she's got to be saying, I've scored in three straight, why not three more straight? It's a, real, it's a mental thing. And if she gets that confidence and she's hitting her stride in the middle of the season, who knows where she ends up. Now a lot of the talk with soccer, it usually goes to the offense, usually goes to the scoring. But defense is just as important in soccer. I mean, this Knights team has just given up two goals in this five-game winning streak. What have they done? How have they done that? The best offense is a good defense. And like we said with volleyball, playing like a cohesive unit. And a back line in soccer is only as good as its weakest link. So they've all been coming together. They crunch. They high pressure. They don't let people get a lot of shots off. So when that happens, if you're not shooting the ball, you can't score. It's that simple. So this takes us to our next game. This is probably the biggest game of the week for UCF sports. UCF women's soccer is going to host Memphis. And Memphis is a powerhouse team this season. They've come in with a record of 8-1. and one. They're currently on a six-game win streak, which they haven't given up a goal during that streak. They've scored 27 goals in nine games, and they've only allowed just three. How does UCF compare to that? <laughs> well... They're going to re need a really great game from their front line. They're going to need to score goals, obviously. Um, I don't think this is the kind of game you play for a draw in. So you might give up a goal, but that means you've got to go out and score two. That being said, that back line, they have to play tight. They can't put too much pressure on the goalkeeper because with that kind of offense, you might be conceding one. So you don't want to concede more than that. You're going to just be in bad sorts if you get behind early on. So, go, so this game... Would you say there's more of a pressure on the defense or the offense? I think it's the defense because the way Kristen and Zandi have been playing, they're bound to get a goal, right? I mean, they've been on it. But the defense, if they can hold them to zero, one goal is enough. But if you're giving up three, four, five goals, that puts a lot more pressure on the offense. So it starts with the defense, the back line, the goalkeeper, and then it just permeates up through the top of the pitch. Well, it's certainly going to be a fun one, and we'll see how that goes on Thursday. So wrapping up the weekend in sports for UCF was the men's soccer team who hosted the University of South Carolina on Sunday. The highly regarded Knights dispatched the Gamecocks 2 to nothing in the match. And no fan should be surprised to see that Cal Jennings scored his seventh goal of the season in this game. In the game, UCF shot 24 times and South Carolina just shot three. Brennan, how was UCF able to make so many shots? This is just the kind of offense that the men's team runs. And I've been lucky enough to be seeing a couple of their games at home and I'm actually not surprised by that number. They've had games where they put up 22 shots, 29 shots, and now 24 shots. Their offense is just, you know, shot by attrition. At some point you're going to wear that defensive line down, you're going to wear down the goalkeeper, and with a guy like Cal who can just seek out the top corner, the bottom corner, wherever he wants to score, he will score it. So as long as you give him a shot or 24, he's going to put one or two away. So let's talk a little bit more about Cal Jennings. He's kind of, he is the superstar of this team. He is the face of this team. And what does he have to do to take, so everyone knows he's an elite player, but what can he do to take his game to the next level and become an all-time national, like a great national player? Oof. Well, he's already up there in goal scored in the nation. I think it's, it's a tough question because even the top flight guys like Lionel Messi, Cristiano Ronaldo, they can score goals like crazy but the critics are always going to say, what else? So for Cal, you might be looking, okay, yeah, he has seven shots a game. Why isn't he putting up 10 shots a game? He's averaging 0.7 assists per match. Why isn't it at a clean one? You know, he's, they're always asking, like, can he make a better dribble? Can he make a better pass? I think it's just a matter of can he get himself involved more than he already has, which I think is difficult. But there's always going to be something with him, no matter how good he gets. 
And uh, test for the Knights. Conference play starts up on Friday. They're going to play Temple. Temple hasn't won yet on the road this season. And uh, each of their losses this season has been a shutout, and they're 2-4. and four. So what do we expect to see in the Knights game this weekend? Well, they've been playing very well at home. You might as well call it a fortress here at UCF. Um, Temple has struggled. So I think it's going to be, you know, give Cal the ball, let him get one or two, and then just kind of rely on Yanni and the goal, make him not work too hard, just let the defense work as a cohesive unit, just be easy, don't overcomplicate things, don't force things, just let it flow. If you let it flow, don't overthink it, easy win. All right, you heard it here first. So it should be an exciting one. All right, Knights fans, buckle down because there are a ton of games to be played on campus this week. The football team is going to host UConn on Saturday at 7 p.m. UCF Volleyball is going to host UConn on Friday and Temple on Sunday. The men's soccer team will play Temple this Friday at home. And last but not least, the women's soccer team will welcome Memphis on Thursday and Tulsa on Sunday. Brendan, as always, I appreciate your input. It's been a pleasure. My pleasure. And thank you to everyone watching at home. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to our YouTube page and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Hitting the Field. I'm Kyle Partain. He's Brendan Schaefer. And we'll catch you next week on Might I Add.